This week on Arizona Illustrated, remembering and honoring the sailors and Marines aboard the USS Arizona and that ship's connection to the U of A, the unspoken language of food, and the art and artist behind Tucson's downtown murals. Hi, I'm Tom McNamara. Welcome to Arizona Illustrated. Today, the United States sends young military men and women around the globe to answer this nation's call of duty, many of them heading to harm's way. You know, back on December 7th of 1941, more than 2,300 military personnel were killed at Pearl Harbor, most of them Marines and sailors aboard the USS Arizona. Here at the University of Arizona, our relationship with that battleship has grown deeper and deeper with each passing year. I'm standing along the new site of the USS Arizona Memorial here on campus, and when this memorial is finished, it'll give visitors an excellent grasp of the sheer size of that battleship. It's outlined on the mall, and it goes all the way from the Cactus Garden to Old Main. And the brick walkway adjacent to the bell tower, that'll contain 1177 bronze medallions one for each man who perished on the ship. On December 7th of this year, the bell from the USS Arizona will ring in the clock tower at the Student Union Memorial Center, marking the 75th anniversary of the attack on Pearl Harbor. Throughout the program, we'll show you images of the various exhibits and displays on campus that commemorate the USS Arizona and those killed on the eve of World War II. But first, we visited with the USS Arizona survivor on his recent visit here to campus. His name is Lauren Bruner. He's a World War II Navy veteran and survivor of the attack on Pearl Harbor. He's here at the University of Arizona to help commemorate the 75th anniversary of the attack that marked day one of all out US involvement in World War II. Six torpedoes from each of our uh, Destroyers. So there's four of them coming right at their, at their fleet. The 96 year old is one of a handful of survivors from the battleship USS Arizona who is still alive. He's here with this group of Navy and Marine ROTC students taking questions and sharing his story. You got to expect it someday. Maybe not. I hope not. Aaron Clayton from Spring, Texas is a naval officer candidate pursuing his degree at the University of Arizona. Not just read about it, not just see it on the TV, but to have history right there in front of you, talking to you, that, that's, that's truly an amazing experience. He just has a ton of life still left in him, and it's just amazing knowing what he went through that day, seeing where he is in his life right now. Thank you, sir, for everything you've taught us. One of those heroes that you never would know about unless someone told you. Thank you for your service, I really appreciate it. Looking forward to carrying on your legacy. Bruner joined the Navy shortly after graduating from Alma High School, just west of Olympia, Washington. After boot camp in San Diego, he received his orders. Here's the USS Arizona. I never see anything that big get afloat. So that was uh, quite a thing to get, get aboard something like that. Arizona was granted statehood in 1912, becoming the 48th state in the Union. It also became the namesake for the USS Arizona, launched out of New York, June 19, 1915. As with all new sailors aboard a ship, he was assigned to the deck force. You're clean and sweep and all of the decks, paintwork and all, keep everything nice and shiny. Several months later, another sailor would report to the USS Arizona, his best friend and high school classmate, William Mann. So I always called him Billy. I didn't know he was even interested in coming in until one day we, we shipped pull back down into uh, Long Beach, California. Was out on the deck cleaning up one guy picked him on the, on the shoulder and said, hey, he says, I'm here. Look around, here's Billy. Billy, Billy Mad. Oh, yeah, we had a great life. And we got time off. We'd, we'd go over, over the beach together, go around and uh, try to find some girls. And we found lots of them. 
Both men would promote into new roles. Billy Mann became a gunner's mate, Bruner a fire controlman in charge of directing the 50 caliber guns on board. I had an aircraft gunnery system that was at the working with the guns, the big 14 inch guns. During his visit to Tucson, Brunner met with student athletes at the U of A, imparting some of that bear down spirit that coaches preach and players love to hear. I hope you guys have a, one hell of a good game tomorrow. He also made his way to Davis Monthan Air Force Base to visit with pilots and crew of the 47th Fighter Squadron. Pilots from the 47th shot down more than half a dozen Japanese warplanes during the Pearl Harbor attack. Here, they share war stories, past and present, finding common bonds that only those who serve can fully understand. The next night at Arizona Stadium, the U of A pays tribute to the USS Arizona and World War II veterans as the 75th anniversary of the attack on Pearl Harbor approaches. Lauren Bruner, wearing a custom-made number 75 team jersey, is honored throughout the game as the Wildcats face off with Hawaii's Rainbow Warriors. Nice uh, summer, summery day, Sunday. It was just before 8 a.m. and he was getting ready to attend church services on the ship. After church, I had a, a date meet a little gal over on the beach. Her name was Nikki. Never got to see her. The USS Arizona's loudspeaker came on. All hands on deck. Man your battle stations. This is not a drill. The surprise attack came in two waves. Bombing grounded US planes at airfields around Pearl Harbor and the U.S. fleet in battleship row. Bruner had reached the fourth deck and had one more to go. Well, I looked up the channel and I could see these planes coming in. They were coming in shooting and there was just ammunition coming all over the place. He was shot twice in the leg by machine gun fire from a Japanese fighter. One big dive and I made that five foot entry right into my battle station. The enemy had struck and he was close. And he just closed up uh, sideways, swung around the uh, front of the ship, between the ships. Big old grin on his face, mouth wide open. I can see all those teeth. You want to reach out and bust him one. But then uh, all heck will broke loose after that. Japanese bombers hit the Arizona four times with their bombs. And one of the bombs hit the Number two turret, which is under my feet and about 20 feet ahead of it. That 1,700-pound bomb glanced off the turret and dove three decks below into the forward powder magazine on the starboard side of the ship. Which, unfortunately, uh, was where my buddy, Billy Mann, that was his station. It just blew the heck out of everything. Lifted, lifted that whole bow, they say, about 30 feet off of the water. It had one hell of a fire. Moored on the port side of the Arizona was a repair ship, the USS Vestal. Crew from the Vestal threw a rope to a position on the forward mast, where Bruner and five shipmates were stranded. And we tied that to it, and there were my six people across that, that, that line. Lauren Bruner was the second to the last to leave the USS Arizona. Shot by enemy fire and burned over 70% of his body, he crossed that line hand over hand nearly 100 feet, charred and bloodied, but undefeated. 2,335 military personnel died at Pearl Harbor. 1,177 sailors and Marines were killed on the USS Arizona. Lauren Bruner was awarded the Purple Heart, and after recovering from his wounds, he reported to the USS Coughlin, fighting in eight more major battles. It's got to be known to the younger ones. You have to remember who was there. That fellow 
men, some of who got through okay, but who were brave enough to stick around and finish it out. You can read more about this American hero in a new book by Ed McGrath and Craig Thompson. It's available online at ussaz.org. To learn more about the USS Arizona and those who served on her, visit The Life and Legacy of the USS Arizona, an extensive exhibit featuring original photographs, historic documents, and memorabilia from the battleship's 26 years at sea. The exhibit's open until December 23rd at the U of A Special Collections on the U of A campus. In addition to the annual ringing of the USS Arizona Bell on December 7th, a remembrance ceremony will be held on the south side of the Student Union. The event will commemorate the 75th anniversary of the bombing of Pearl Harbor and will include the dedication of the USS Arizona Mall Memorial. That's here at the U of A Mall on Sunday, December 4th at 3 p.m. This is the time of year when we gather with family and friends, inevitably around a big meal. And there's more at play around that meal than you may realize. You see, the language of food is wonderful and complex, and we all speak it, whether you know it or not. Breaking bread together is a simple but powerful tradition that is centuries old. Biblical references speak to the potential of a shared meal to bring us closer, to make peace, to nourish the body as well as the soul. Most immigrants come to this country with food in their minds because they have experienced food insecurity that sometimes is very severe in their home countries. In fact, we know from testimony that many of the Ellis Island immigrants that came to the United States tell stories about the first meal that they ate here was in some ways an act of redemption. In fact, food is so... Maribel Alvarez is a professor of anthropology at the University of Arizona. Here, she speaks to an audience at the Fox Theater on the importance of food in our social fabric. She is also a folklorist, which she describes as the work of the ordinary, documenting the traditions and culture of everyday life including food. The number one and most classic way is always the feast, the special occasion, the killing of a particular animal to celebrate, the shedding of blood, which so many of us will shriek at, represents the possibility of life flowing before us in the most religious rituals uh, that we can imagine. You see that dimension. In our contemporary world, we have the food festival as a version of that. Yes, we have Thanksgiving at home, and yes, we have a special Christmas dinner, and we have tamales at Christmas, all of which are different forms of feasting, but we also have food festivals, which are large public civic events. You don't have to be religious to go to a food festival. And this becomes a way of us feeling connected to each other in a sort of civic arena. Alvarez says that we've made a false separation between the biological and the sociological when it comes to the study of food. When you think about it, both of them come together in pretty significant ways. In fact, the very formation of our ability to be social beings has to do with our ability to share nourishment so that we can survive. And if we can survive, then that means we can reproduce. But then attached to that, the possibility that it is also a form of language. It is, it is the first language that we learn for communication. It's the one that we grab on when we're feeling happy. It's the one that we reject when we don't like something. I mean, love looking at babies and the expression on their faces when they absolutely taste something that they don't like. Food is definitely more than survival, you know. It's probably the most complete artistic experience that we can have because it involves literally all the senses, taste, touch, smell, and it's something that everyone can understand. Jared McKinley is a botanist, food enthusiast, and former associate publisher of Edible Baja, Arizona. He now runs Rancho Gatito, an experimental urban homestead on Tucson's west side, a place focused on how local food and culture intersect in our region. 
He says that food and physiology intersect too, and not just in the obvious ways. You know, food calms us down. It, it physically calms us down. It calms us down by triggering our parasympathetic nervous system, the soothing response that kicks in when we are rested and nourished. Whatever you have going on in your head in the moment beforehand when there wasn't food around, you know, you start eating and digesting food, that blood shunts to the belly, you're not up here anymore. You're not starting to think about, you know, why am I different than this person? You're just, you're just being with that person. And food more than anything else causes people to calm down come together and stop thinking, really. It really was a game changer, this fire thing. While Alvarez acknowledges the evolutionary wiring, she marvels at the complexity of the cultural moments that are common in our food sharing rituals. At the family table, of course, I don't have to tell you, is where we have the most intense conversations. The laughing, the crying, the falling in love, the rolling of your eyes, the holding back disgust, all of this range of emotions happen, and here's this thing. Culture is doing all of that, and you're not even aware of it. You're just living it and experiencing it. It's all happening in your body, it's participating actively of this ritual, but in the back of your mind, you're just taking it as ordinary life. Alvarez sees the tradition of gathering to share food as a theatrical stage of sorts, where we communicate in ways we might not otherwise. It is okay to accept that food is performative, that it is one mechanism by which we are actually able to say, look, there's a whole bunch of things I want to say to you and I don't know how, but here's something I cook for you. Or come home for dinner. I don't need to declare that I trust you, you are my trusted associate, I want to be your friend forever. Those things that may be awkward, I can actually perform them. When we eat together, it can cut both ways, bringing us closer, but also leaving us vulnerable and exposed. The host labors intensely to make sure that you're comfortable, that you have what you need. And if for some reason something is served that will make the, the guests uncomfortable, the host is immediately attentive to try to remedy the situation. It requires a certain leap, a certain empathy, a certain sense of kindness and forgiveness that I may not get it all right. I never been to your house to dinner, uh, I may not know how you do it in your home. With food and drink comes conversation, that intimate back and forth between people sharing a moment. <laughs> uh, what about that conversation that is had in the kitchen? The one that is whisper, right? That is part of the food environment. It facilitates the desire to be confessional. Alvarez says that sharing food helps send the psychological message that we are satisfied, and that fulfillment can resonate deeply in our lives. It means I'm okay as a person. It's not very far from saying I'm loved. It's not very far from saying I'm taken care of, I'm secure, I'm safe. What all of that points out to is that it is a rich language. And if we think about food as a language, then you begin to see the many ways in which it communicates that range from the very mundane and prosaic to the poetic and the lovely. If you've been to downtown Tucson lately, you've probably noticed a significant increase in color. Walls and sides of buildings that were once beige or off-white are now awash in red and orange, blue and yellow. An outdoor gallery of imagery now, inspired by the city's rich cultural diversity, our history, and our urban fabric. These are the downtown murals. I wanted to do this project because a friend of mine moved to Richmond, Virginia and he randomly sent me all these pictures of these murals on these walls and he said, wouldn't this be great for Tucson? And so I started looking into it. When I saw the grant opportunity through the Tohono O'odham, I said, wow, what a great opportunity. I wrote up the grant and I guess they thought it was a good idea. <laughs> this is really big. But I, I, I like it. it. It really makes a great impression. You know, Tucson is many things, uh, but shy is not one of them. There were a lot of people that said, oh, you know, the city has tried murals before and they didn't really work. 
And I tried to keep those kind of noises quiet because I knew that, you know, with the right partners that we could definitely execute a pretty successful program. A friend of mine told me about it. She saw the call to artists on the news. I went to the Tucson Arts Brigade page, saw the, um, the application. We kind of went around downtown and identified different buildings that we wanted to see beautified. There was a mention that it, they were the largest buildings in Tucson and, and I thought, man, I've been painting the city my entire life. I should have one of those murals. So after we selected the areas, I wrote an RFP outlining kind of what we wanted to see in the artwork. We submitted a floating design and then when the wall owner accepted it, we came and actually got to see the wall. The ones that we ended up selecting uh, were mainly associated with the quality of the work that they'd done, their previous experience, and really kind of innovative approaches to um, what is part of public art. I turned in the application, I could not stop thinking about it, and I was just like on pins and needles waiting, so it was like surreal when I actually heard that I was chosen. This is the first thing I've ever done this big. So the three figures represent new beginnings and nurturing and growth. I learned a ton. Working on this scale is like, it's so drastically different than working small, but then you see the similarities and you see the, the skills that I've already acquired and how they apply on a grand scale, and that's kind of interesting. For me, the biggest thing is you can't, um, you can't move, move it around. You can't flip it upside down to take a look at it. You can't turn it to the wall for two weeks. Ready, go. Forward, march. It's like a Wes Anderson movie, except not funny <laughs> with tears instead of laughter. <laughs> We met last winter, yeah. and I felt like we had a, a really strong connection yeah. um, pretty quickly. And Rachel has m more public art experience than I, and I wanted more experience. The piece is called Sagrada Corazón de Tucson, which means Sacred Heart of Tucson. The executive director of Cafe 54 told us in a meeting that she chose our mural because of heart representation and that Cafe 54 is a heart focused and heart centered organization. So when she said that, it just like, for me, it yeah. clicked. Well, let's, I'd like to go over and get that bat. The texture of the wall. The texture of the wall, yes. And it's out to get us. It is, it's um, very bumpy, like trying to grind cold hard butter into an English muffin. 100%. All day long. Ooh. Drop it like it's hot. It's scary, but, but it's fun. You know, I didn't know that this was gonna be the wall, so basing my design, I had to fit it to that at a later time, and so I pretty much have to paint a few things and then come right back down, step, step back a couple hundred feet, and then go back up. What's that? I'm convinced that you know everybody. What? Because you do. I just know a lot of people, huh? I know. Well, see, now you're going to know a lot of people. You should, man. You got to get that artwork out there. I have an assistant, Christina Perez, and she's working great with me. And she'll, she'll run the machine, and I'll paint, and then I'll run the machine, and she'll paint. I got involved through the Tucson Arts Brigade. I said to myself, if they need help, I'm going to do it. I went to work and I told them, hey, I'm not gonna work for a month. I'm gonna be helping with a mural. And they said, okay. <laughs> I like the challenge. This thing is gonna be fully detailed and with meticulous line work and uh, the, best, the best color and the best composition that I can possibly paint. Well, I kind of just did it. I kind of just <laughs> didn't really ask for permission. The way that we justify this program through economic development is that, you know, beautifying the streets not only brings visual attraction, but it also brings people downtown. It gets them to kind of linger longer. Businesses that are located close to the murals 
they tend to see higher foot traffic and that's been pretty much well established throughout the country. This area was pretty much dead before the studios started moving in and it really makes a large economic impact. Oh, I'm ecstatic. Yeah, watching it. When it first started, I was questioning what it was gonna be like. And then as he continued, the detail work he puts into the project is just amazing. It was fun. He's a great mentor. Grab, grab that map. And it's cool. People stop and take pictures. People that you don't know compliment you and thank you. And I'm gonna miss it. <laughs> I'm just not going to miss the sun beating up on me. It's a great relief. We're it's, very happy. It's going to be nice to detox some paint and yes. be out of the sun for a while. We've got a lot of happy people down here, too. I just went and did a lot of line work and then filled in the colors. Um, I waited till very late in the process to do the detail on the face. I like the idea of having something that I can take family and friends to for a long time. And now I have more murals floating around my head. Like I was working at home on some domestic tasks and then I was like, I need to, I need to draw this. I hope this, this you know, doesn't remain the biggest mural in Tucson. I mean, I'd like to be the one that paints that, of course, but, but I hope that more of, of this size actually pop up. We've applied for another round of grants. Uh, we've asked for double the amount that we received previously because we would like to expand it to the greater uh, downtown area. So I just want to again offer congratulations and thanks to everyone who's been involved with this project because it helps make Tucson a more beautiful and vibrant city. Thank you for joining us here on Arizona Illustrated. A reminder that on Sunday, December 4th at 3 p.m., there'll be a ceremony commemorating the 75th anniversary of the bombing of Pearl Harbor, including the dedication of the USS Arizona Mall Memorial here on the University of Arizona campus. We'll be taking a break for the next couple of weeks, but we'll be back on December 11th with a special story about the person behind some of Southern Arizona's most original structures, a special Arizona Illustrated, the architect, Judith Chafee. I'm Tom McNamara. See you soon.